native ISO. We've covered this before a year ago for the Pocket 4K, but with the release of the 6K Pro and some of the new updates to it, I thought it was time to go ahead and update that video and expand on it with another year's worth of experience and with different settings in the 6K Pro. So buckle your seatbelts as we go on one roller coaster ride of a topic that has varying contradictory information and that seemingly no one can agree on how it really works. So let's talk about it. Before we jump into this video, I wanted to invite you to be part of the Frame Voyager community. Frame Voyager is all about finding awesome stories to tell and helping you to find yours through our videos and getting to interact with other filmmakers and storytellers that are already part of this channel. So be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell to keep up to date with all of our content. Now let's go back to the video. All right, the first thing we need to address is what is ISO? And because there are plenty of resources that go in depth on what ISO is, I'll just be quickly talking about this. ISO is simply your camera's sensitivity to light and it was a rating in old film reels for light sensitivity of film. In modern cameras, ISO refers to the camera sensor sensitivity to light and increasing and decreasing it to add or reduce light. In digitally amplifying the ISO levels like this, you can run into some issues like noise, image quality, or color shift in some of your images. Now, different cameras have different tolerances when it comes to this problem. All cameras have a sweet spot in their ISO that is known as native ISO. Native ISO is the baseline setting your camera is set at to achieve the most most detail out of your image. Going above or below this will digitally again unamplify or amplify the sensor's sensitivity to light it's capturing. So these are levels you generally are advised to stay at when filming to get the best results without any of the effects that over amplifying or, or under amplifying can cause. This brings us to the interesting case of the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema cameras, which offer dual native ISO systems. This offers users a camera with two systems of ISO that can be utilized to give you more flexibility over lighting situations. The two systems go from 100 to 1000 ISO with a native ISO of 400, and the second system goes from 1250 ISO to 25600 ISO with a native ISO of 3200. When you adjust your settings in the camera, it will automatically switch to the secondary ISO system when you surpass the 1000 ISO. This means that when you're shooting in a poorly lit situation, you can kick it into that higher ISO and still get a clean image at the brighter 3200 ISO, while again being at a native ISO. Blackmagic optimized it this way to minimize grain or noise in the footage while maintaining the full dynamic range of the sensor. And dynamic range, for those of you who don't know, is the camera's ability to capture stops of light above and below middle gray. The more dynamic range you have, the better your camera is able to capture the highlights and shadows in an image, giving it a more pleasant roll off essentially. And there's some other things that go into that, but on, like the more dynamic range you have, the better it is. And some of it has to do with the sensor quality too, but generally speaking, more dynamic range, better quality. More dynamic range, better quality when it comes to different lit situations. The Pocket 6K Pro is said to have 13 stops of a dynamic range, peaking at about 13.4 stops at 400 ISO, and in the secondary ISO system, peaking at about 12.1 at 3200 native ISO. This is where you have to start thinking um, differently about how you film with this camera versus the DSLR or mirrorless camera equivalents that rarely have dual ISO systems. Each time you adjust your ISO levels, the dynamic range values shift where they're at, meaning that if you're at native ISO of 400, you have 5.9 stops above middle gray and 7.5 stops below of dynamic range. This means that for this ISO, you have slightly more dynamic range in the shadows or simply put the darker areas of your footage. Now, if you went all the way back to 100 ISO, you only have 3.9 stops above middle gray, but 9.5 below, meaning that oddly enough, you have very little range on the highlights of your image if you shoot at 100 ISO. You would actually have better success filming and exposing for 1000 ISO in direct sunlight since it has 7.3 stops above middle gray, which is about four stops more than 100 ISO has. It's Kind of crazy, but that's how they have it set up. Meaning if you properly expose again for 1000 ISO, you'll get way much more, you'll get way more details and highlights than at 100. The secondary ISO system is also fairly similar to this. And this is why as you learn to expose these cameras and the 6K Pro, any understanding how the dynamic range has shifted when you change your ISO is crucial to getting good quality footage 
if you shoot at the wrong ISO level, even with the ability to change it in post, you'll likely not be able to get the footage to the appropriate setting. That is why I always recommend filming at the native ISO levels. Here, you get a more balanced, dynamic range, and it's the ISO setting that is supposed to give you the best image quality. I've had a lot of people express to me that they find that 400 ISO has more noise in it than 100 ISO. But with raw footage, you will typically see more of that noise or grain uh, on it than a non-raw codec. So even though it may have more noise, that doesn't, more noise and grain does not always equal a bad thing. When it, there's a point where it gets to a bad thing. But here, when you're shooting at 400, it's, it's totally fine. And honestly, you can go and fix that in DaVinci Resolve. They have settings for it. And again, I've talked about this in previous videos, but I've linked a video to how people get rid of noise in their, their B-RAW footage from DaVinci Resolve. So here are a few reasons. I also recommend always filming at native ISO. To me, Having it at 400 ISO gives me some wiggle room when editing and if I got my exposure wrong. Now this will only work again if you're in B-RAW and you're able to adjust it in post. I have plenty of room to adjust other ISO levels above or below this level if I've managed to overexpose or underexpose an image, which can happen when you film run and gun like I do. And I try to make sure I film properly, but you know, you do have those moments where it doesn't always come together perfectly and having a wide range um, on either side of the ISO to go up higher to give a little bit more exposure or down just a little bit more to kind of balance it out really helps because if you film at 100 ISO and it's too bright, there's nowhere to go. Also, you really shouldn't be filming at 100 ISO if it's bright. Moving on to the next point. As mentioned before, this option has a fairly balanced dynamic range, making it perfect for normal lighting situations with, again, a 5.9 dynamic range above middle gray and 7.5 below. It gives you a decent amount of range on both sides of middle gray. I would only recommend going to other ISO levels when extreme lighting conditions call for it. And lastly, the last thing you should be doing is adjusting your ISO levels. You will want to utilize your aperture and ND filters first and only start dipping into ISO when that alone is not enough. But when you do have to do that, remember to reference where the dynamic range levels lie in the ISO you are changing to. The absolute last thing you really wanna do is adjust to 100 ISO in a brightly lit environment because it has so little dynamic range in the highlights. Just like you may wanna consider just moving to the secondary ISO in darker situations because even at 3200 ISO, you will be getting more dynamic range below middle gray than you would at 1000 ISO. It will produce a lot less noise. And now, as I say with all my videos, take what I say with a grain of salt because in your environment, things may work differently. I would say the general idea of staying at a native ISO is probably a good one to, just to adhere to and kind of work from that to these different levels. Understanding the theory and technical reasons behind all of this is always key, but so is seeing it with your own eyes and working with the camera in your own environment and to see what it does firsthand. It's always important to test a lot of these things for yourself and just see what the camera does for you because sometimes they do different things in different circumstances, but depending on what you film. But in general, staying at your native ISOs, you can't really go wrong with that, exposing properly for it. This is a critical part of the camera to understand and it can help you out a ton before you go out filming for a client or project and come back with footage that just looks wrong. That's about it for today's video. If you have any questions, because this is a little strange of a topic, please feel free to comment below and I will get back to you as soon as I can or I'll address them in the next Q&A video, which if you haven't seen the last one, I've linked to it in the description below. Hope you guys have enjoyed this video. Get out there and film and I'll see you in the next video.